Galatians chapter 6, the Bible says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Help me tell the truth from your holy Bible. You pray that your saints would be edified. We'd all be better for it. Help me, Lord. Help us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at the first verse. It says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault. And it doesn't say sin here. It says fault. That's interesting. A fault can certainly be defined as an implication of wrong. We typically hear this as parents when we're raising our children. It's brother's fault. No, it's sister's fault. But that doesn't change because then when we get married, no, it's her fault. No, it's his fault. <laughs> if something happens at work, it certainly wasn't my fault. It was the other guy's fault. We tend to want to find fault with others. And certainly there is a definition that implies wrong. But also a fault can be defined as a defect. Wrong hasn't been done by someone specifically. No implication of wrong in an individual. But, oh, that, that machine is faulty. There wasn't anything I did, but there's something faulty with the machine. It's not working. The widget is faulty. It's not working. We typically, by our human nature, look to find fault with someone else. And it's who is it that I can blame? If a horse kicks you, my son went on, we took him on a little horsemanship uh, adventure. And uh, one of the first lessons he learned is that uh, the trainer said, that, you know, people want to blame the horse if they get kicked. And he went through this whole lesson about how you need to uh, announce your intentions. <laughs> and he went through all different training things and all different ways of communicating with the horse. Um, but the horse does something and people want to blame the horse. Oh, that dumb horse. Well, no, it's dumb trainer. You did something that you shouldn't have done. And now you're blaming the horse. Um, child spills the milk. Whose fault is it? Parent yells at the child. Well, maybe the parent didn't teach the child not to spill the milk. Something goes wrong in, in your life. Something goes wrong in my life. And we look immediately to find fault with someone else. We rarely, when something goes wrong, say, Lord, what did I do? <laughs> That's not on the radar yet. We want to get everybody else out of the way. <laughs> and then last resort, we'll turn to ourselves. That's human nature. We all do that. Can, can, can we say amen? Okay, amen. Uh, fault can also be a difficulty. In Matthew 18, the Bible says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault. Between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Here's an example of a fault. Maybe it's not a sin. Maybe it's a difficulty in someone's life. Maybe there's a little bit of a rub. Maybe there's some wrong implied. But instead of announcing somebody's fault to the whole world, the first thing we should do is what? Go to the brother. If somebody offends you, don't tell me. If somebody does something wrong to you, don't try to bring it in front of the whole church. Go to the brother. Go to the sister. Hey, sister, why did you do this? Hey, brother, why did you do that? Well, I, oh, okay. And you, you clear up 
the fault finding or the miscommunication or whatever it is. The Bible says, brethren, in Galatians chapter six, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, we talked about biblical spirituality in the Sunday school lesson. So you can get that online if you missed it. Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Isn't it neat how God puts fault and restore in the same verse? God is a God of restoring. And our command is not to be a fault finder. Believe me, they'll come up. <laughs> our job, our command as Christians from our Savior is to be a restorer. That's what God wants for you and I. If you or if I or if we are the ones continuing to look to be a fault finder, we're not walking in the spirit. And we're not so spiritual. There's people that live their lives and they just, their, their motive is, I'm here. Everybody look at me. I'm here so that I can pick out your fault, your fault, your fault, your fault, your fault, your fault, your fault. Your fault. Oh, well, do you have any faults? Well, no, because I'm me. And if you do pick out their fault, they'll leave. Because the relationship is only going to get so close. And they're going to be the ones coming in and looking for the faults. Well, I got news for you. Follow me around for a week. And you'll find some of my faults. If you have to live with somebody, you find out their faults real quick. If you don't have to live with somebody, well, you can come to church for an hour and behave. <laughs> you know, look, nobody's kids are that spiritual. If you can come to church for an hour and your sit and your kids sit, you come in, you sit for 45 minutes, nobody moves, and then you leave and go home. Well, that's easy. Anybody can do that. Get in a relationship where it's full time. You come early, the kids run, the kids play, the kids sit for church, they play afterwards, they do ministry together, they pass out tracks together, they run and play out. Do it full time and then see how well behaved they are. Nobody's kids are that spiritual. And if you're continuing to look for faults, I got news for you, you don't have to look for them, they're going to come up. My kids play with your kids long enough, there's going to be fault finding. Oh, no. Oh, no. We've got to. No, here's what you got to do. Restore it. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I've already raised kids. So we've got grandkids. So we have great grandkids. This isn't anything you haven't heard or known before. You work it out. If you have a fault with a sister or a brother, look to work it out. Are we supposed to be a, a team? Are we supposed to be a church family? Mm -hmm. If we're going to keep looking at each other just to fault find, that is not being spiritual. The faults are going to come. They're going to be there. That's life. That's relationships. And this idea that we're going to have this picture perfect little Pinterest, Facebook, uh, magazine view of <laughs> life, it is not real it's not real i want something real i want something authentic and that means there's going to be faults in it what's the man's most famous saying when his wife looks at him well my fault <laughs> they're going to be there faults are going to be there you are to be a restorer and when you look to be a restorer you're spiritual. You're walking in the spirit. <laughs> you know how they you know who they found no fault in? Our precious and blessed and majestic Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to. 
and a man with no faults, no implied wrong, no sin, no faulty machinery, no went to the cross to pay for your and I's sins who are filled with faults. Just to touch the surface and Christ died for us. You think we ought to kind of be like Jesus and follow that example of Jesus looks down and sees false, 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 false. And then when I really pull back the layer, sin, 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 sin. And then I really peel back the layer, man, just dark wickedness. And he went to the cross and died for you. Why? To restore you and I to himself. Do you kind of think he would want us as his body to have that same type of restorative measure? I think so. So how do you become spiritual? Well, we just talked about this morning and we preached about in earlier lessons to walk in the spirit. But what I'm going to park on right now is we have to stop neglecting the clear command that was given us in Galatians chapter six, verse one, which is to be a restorer. This is not a command just for church leaders. It's a command for all Christians. We cannot use. Well, ye which are spiritual. And just apply that to church leaders and use that as our out to say, you know what? I'm not going to be a restorer. We'll let the church leaders, whatever that's supposed to mean. No, this is supposed to mean for all people that are in Christ. That would be brothers and sisters. That would be the whole body. We need to look to be a restorer. How? In the spirit of meekness. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit. Look what it says. Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of punishment. I just want to punish that person. That person did wrong. And preacher, if you don't bring the hammer down on them, if you don't bring it in front of the whole church, if you don't bring it in front of the whole town, if you don't publicize it everywhere, we need to really, we need to punish that person for what they did. How about we do that to you, buddy? How about we take a little video of your life and portray it out in the scene in front of the church? Because you ain't that spiritual. And I'm telling you, people that think that way are carnal. They're not spiritual. No matter what you think it looks like, it, it's not that. It isn't that. The person that is looking to restore is the spiritual one. And you're supposed to restore in the spirit of meekness. Yes, you have to address it. But if your end goal is to, oh, I just can't wait for everybody to find out about this person's fault. That's not the spirit of meekness. That's the spirit of the devil is what that is. It's a spirit of meekness. It means it's the right attitude. It's under control. And the right attitude is essential. People do right things with wrong motives all the time. You might have met some people. You might have been like that in different areas of your life in the past. You might be dealing with something right now. Personally, that you're bringing to your mind. Do right. But if you approach a situation with character and with the right attitude, then the action by default will come out right. But if you approach something and you just want to do the action right, so everybody sees that you're right and can't find any fault in you, that doesn't default to a right spirit and right attitude. There's a difference. If you approach something in the spirit of meekness, in a spirit of restoration, and your heart's right and your character's right, by default, your action will be right. And I think that's where we should all be at. Why? Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Uh, it helps the spiritual restorer stay spiritual and not prideful, self-righteous, and conceited. 
that's a tough basket of apples right there. You want to get that bad apple out of there. If that's you, if that's me, change. We don't want to approach something with a prideful, self-righteous attitude. Now, watch what it says in uh, verse number two. We'll read a couple of verses here. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. It, how many have said this? Look, I've got my own problems. You know what that means? It means I don't want to bear your problem. <laughs> That's what that means. Spouse says, honey, I need help. Look, I've got my own problems. <laughs> I've got my own work. I've got my own this. I've got my own schedule. All that means is, look, I got a better idea for me. <laughs> and it's me not helping you because I got burdens I got to bear. You got your own problems. Go work it out. But that's not what the Bible says. Sorry to inform anybody or make this a negative message, but a burden is a load. A burden is a difficulty. A burden is grievous and wearisome. And it's not the everyday daily responsibilities of make the bed, get dressed, do the laundry, fix a meal, clean the kitchen, go to work, mow the grass, dig a hole, plant a flower. It's not the everyday things. It's these loads and these difficulties and these wearisome things that come up that are overwhelming somebody. It would be called in the Greek real life okay <laughs> real life because family members die that's real life cars break down people lose jobs the fauci flu comes and gets people in the hospital and on a ventilator it's called real life and it hurts sometimes and god says if you're a christian help another christian out i'm telling you i'm thankful Josiah and I work in a, a tournament out in Ohio in, in PA trying to get back. The snow starts coming and coming. I can't make it back without killing myself. Brother Kelly just steps up and, and covers the pulpit and, and takes that burden, takes that load off of me so I'm not so stressed. Takes a little bit of that, just dials it back, shaves a little bit of it off, makes life a little bit easier. That's the way that it ought to be. Uh, notice it says, uh, let's let's read it. Um, let's read it like uh, some people live it. Be a burden to someone. <laughs> it, it doesn't say be a burden just to kind of clear it up. It says, bear ye one another's burden, just in case you might have had a modern version that wants to tweak it. It says to bear somebody's burden. Why? You would fulfill the law of Christ and not the law of you. Look at it in John 13. Look at John 13. John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. It's interesting that Jesus said that three times. Love one another, love one another, love to one another. <laughs> it's almost like people don't get it. And Jesus has to say the same thing three times in two verses. But why is it a new commandment? Because we're following after a new pattern. It's the pattern of Jesus Christ. He loved us enough to die for us. But God commendeth his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why? Because he loved you. And Jesus Christ didn't agree with 
anything about you. You think he looked down and said, oh, look at what a what a sweet southern gal. Look at that. Look at those southern gentlemen. You know what? I just want to come down because they're just so. No. He looked at you and saw you as his enemy. Saw you as a wicked, defiled sinner with a black heart whose every motive is absolutely wicked and evil. How's that for uplifting? I don't care what Joel Osteen tells you. He's wrong. It, this is an uplifting sermon. You're wicked. Your heart is black. You are covered in sin. You are in the depths of hell. You are condemned and Jesus Christ said, I love you so much that you are my enemy and I'm going to come down and bleed out on a cross for you. And he did that to uplift you out of hell and save you from hell fire. That's uplifting. Every day is a Friday is a lie. How to have your best life now is a lie. You want to have your best life now? Get in Jesus Christ. That's the only way you're going to have a great life because you got eternal life. People say, get a life. I got a life. It's eternal. Why don't you get in on it? <coughs> that is uplifting. When you finally realize how low you are and no type of humanistic, man-centered, fleshly driven, worldly entertainment is going to do anything but change and water down and destroy the message of Jesus Christ and why he came. He came to save you from your sin. And that's called love. And we have a new pattern to follow after. And if any of us is under any type of severe stress, if any of us have ever been crushed by a major life strain, fulfill the law of Christ and offer some relief. After all, Jesus Christ offered the greatest relief for us. I tend to do things, and I guess, I guess because I'm a multitasker at heart, I guess because I'm overdriven, in overdrive, driven too much. So you tend to get your hand in too many things, and you start to forget, well, you know, you want to do a, you want to get prepared for church. You want to prepare your messages. You want to get the church house ready. And then after church, not only do you want to get lunch, but then you want to go out and do public ministry. And so you do all these things. The more things you do, the more opportunity you give yourself to make faults. Well, we only have one truck. We only have one vehicle. Last door we knocked on before we're going to head back to the church house. Somehow. Somehow I locked my keys in the truck. Me, Josiah, Wesley. And ironically enough, it was right after Wesley said, now, Josiah, we'll, we'll let the young guys go to this door. You can, you, can, you can stay back. It was right after he said that that I got out of the truck and I locked my keys in the truck. I should have just listened. <laughs> I should have just listened to the youngins. <laughs> but I didn't. And there we are. My truck, was it running? Did I leave it running or did I turn it off? The truck is off. It's in some stranger's driveway. And Wesley and Josiah are knocking on that person's door, giving them the gospel. Praise God they weren't pagans. <laughs> what do I do? Well, I call my wife and she says, well, I don't know what to tell you to do because, <laughs> so, you know, I call Brother Kelly. And again, he shows up. He's like, you know, the rescue machine. He's like the restorer of the church. He comes, gets Wesley and Josiah, drops the boy off, gets Hannah and Cheyenne, comes back, gets me. I'm standing there in this, in this guy's driveway with my truck. 
that cut, I already created enough stress for people. And somebody comes along and just shaves a little bit off and makes the load a little, a little bit lighter, at least for a few hours. But that's a blessing. It's a blessing. The ice storm came, you know, you're, you're under just a load of stress. You got no generator, electric company. They don't know when, they, when it's going to come back on. And if you stay in your house, not only will you just be cold, you just start fussing with each other. So we come up here and just start working at the church house. We pull all the wallpaper out and painting and all that. It's stressful. It's a burden. It's a load. Miss Caroline, just right there to we'll fix you some hot meals. And, oh, boy, we scarf that down. And just a little bit, just to take a little bit of the load off. So it's like, ah, I can kind of stand up a little straight. It's not so heavy. That's what Christians ought to do. We should be there to bear each other's burden and to just shave off when these major life stressors happen. And that's what God wants from all of us. In verse number three, it says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Conceited Christians are horrible people. I really believe that. They're just horrible people. And they might be saved and praise God. We'll see him in glory. But until then, stay away from me. <laughs> I, I, you can't help take stress or burden off those types of people. They're so full of themselves, they can't enter into any type of full-time relationship because, well, you know, get over yourself, okay? Get over yourself. If you're too good for anybody and everybody, then go start Living Room Baptist and see how many people come to your living room. See how many people you, you're so spiritual, see how many people you can get to follow you. <laughs> I'm telling you, these people that are just too good for everybody, it's not spiritual. They're just professional legalists is what they are. They're unrighteously judgmental. And they always have a verse to defend their spiritual position. They're not a restorer. They're a fault finder. And the ironic thing is, they can't see their own faults. I don't want to be like that. A fault finder is someone who is always unwilling to yoke together and be a help to anybody. And you know why they withdraw? Not because some, because there's some major doctrine error, because look, it's not like, it's not like if, you, if you're if you not King James, you can't go find a church that isn't King James. Because that wouldn't work for him either. It's not like if you're a Calvinist and you go to another church that's Reformed. Well, because they can't do that either. <laughs> it's like all these major doctrines are established and people find their crowd. If you're a Calvinist, of course you're not going to come here. You're going to go to a Reformed church. <laughs> that's not the point. They can't plug in anywhere because nobody's got right doctrine. Everybody's wrong. Except them. And that's the fault finding attitude. We need to be careful of that. I said that to say they withdraw because they think they're something, but they're nothing and they're deceived. And it's a sad place to be. For if any man, for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And I want to be careful, and I would suggest we all be careful. We say, well, we made it this far, or I made it this far. By God's grace, we are what we are. I go back too far in my life. I don't want to stay there too long. Because I remember who I was, what I was involved with, the things that I've done. And that's not going to edify anybody. 
And you probably can do the same thing. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. We're saved by God's grace. And if you're at a point in your life right now where things are going good, just be careful of saying, well, I made it. No, God made you. God brought you. God delivered you. God protected you. We need to be careful. Be very, very careful. You've gotten good at something. You're good at a sport. Be careful you're not worshiping a sports hero. Be careful you're not worshiping yourself. Is God your hero? Or is some man that's running around in a pair of tights your hero? My Savior bore the sins of the world and died on a cross. What does your baseball player do? Throw a 90-mile-hour fastball. Ooh, wow, I'm impressed. My God died for the sins of the world. I'm for You got a ball bat and a ball glove. It's great. I love it. But I'm not going to worship your ability or my ability to throw a football, swing a ball bat, kick a soccer ball, or throw an orange ball through a hoop. I'm not. God gave you that ability. Use it for God's glory. You good in an instrument? Are you playing for applause or are you playing for God? Are you, are you, are you, are you the fastest runner on the track team? Are you praising yourself or are you thanking God that he gave you legs that work and run and are healthy? It's our perspective and it's our motive. For the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ. And then verse four says, but let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. We all have personal responsibility. And when the Bible says to prove his own work, we do need to examine ourselves. And the reason there is no self-condemnation is because there is no self-examination. Like we were talking about in the beginning, everybody wants to look for others' faults and only look at their own. And right here, as we wind down the message, we're seeing that we need to examine ourselves. Let every man prove his own work. We can't figure out everybody else's problem and not look at our own. How can your work be proven? How can your work be approved of God? One, it has to be a godly foundation. It has to be built on the will of God and the word of God. Not, like we spoke about earlier, human praise, human effort, and the worship of your or mine just our strong, indomitable will to press on. What are you worshiping? The foundation needs to be built on the will of God and the word of God. And then your work is proven. Not only if you have a godly foundation, but if you have a godly performance. Before God, what you do is your heart clear. Before you go into any situation or make a decision, is your heart clear before God? If it isn't, put the brakes on. People don't put the brakes on. And then they get into a situation, they get into a relationship, they get into some type of now experience they got to deal with that they wouldn't have had to deal with if they would have had godly performance. And they would have said, you know what? My heart's not clear about this before God. I need to stop. A godly foundation, your work will be proven. Godly performance, your work will be proven. And then a godly ending. Young people especially, you have a good start. You have a good foundation. You have good upbringing, good church family. It's great that you start well. What's more important is that you finish well. Finish strong. Finish what you started. We see that principle in the Bible. Count the cost so that you can finish what you start. Don't just build a foundation. You ever drive around town and you see the start of a foundation? It's cleared out and that foundation is built. But then a year goes by and that's all it's done. 
and then two years, and then three years, and everybody looks by it and says, hmm, they never finish. Man, that's the strongest foundation in town, but they never finish. You want to be able to finish what you started, have a good start. Uh, this story, everybody heard of the Mona Lisa. They say it's the most famous painting in the world. So they took a bunch of art students and they put these art students in a room and they said, your job, your project is you are to reproduce the Mona Lisa. So all of these art students, you see them, their eyes are on that Mona Lisa and some of them are getting real close and they're, you know, and looking at a different angle and, and, and uh, they're just intently focused. But one student, he hardly takes his eyes off the paper. He might look up once, twice, but for the most part, his eyes are focused on his paper. And his eyes aren't focused on the Mona Lisa painting. And at the end of it, you know, he comes up with Humpty Dumpty on the wall, and the, you know, the, jumped over the moon and the whole thing, and he don't pass the class. because he took his eye off of what he was supposed to reproduce. That's us. Jesus Christ paid our sin debt. He wants us to be like him. And you know what we do as Christians? We take our eyes off of Jesus Christ. Instead of living our life this way, looking up, instead of living our life looking to Christ as our example, we're running around and we're just pulled around by the world. And when the world pulls us this way, and we go, and our heads are down. Every once in a while, we might look up. You know, it's Christmas or Easter or something that, you know, someone's having a little, you know, a, a, a cantata at church or something we'll go to. But for the most part, we're just, you know, getting pulled around by the world. Every now and then, our eyes will look up. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, that's right. We're down south. <laughs> that's not the way it works, folks. Keep your eyes on what you are supposed to reproduce. You're supposed to be a replica of Jesus Christ. He is supposed to mold you. He is supposed to make you. The Holy Spirit is supposed to guide you. But we so often take our eyes off of who they are supposed to be on. And the next thing you know, we know more about politics and we know more about the world's amusements than we do about the Bible. And it's nobody's fault. Fault. But our own. Who are we trying to reproduce? We need to get our eyes off of the earthly junk and get our eyes on someone that's worth reproducing. And you know what the canvas is? Our hearts. Our hearts. Then we'll have the spirit of meekness. We'll be a restorer. Galatians chapter 6 verse 4. And then shall he have rejoicing. In himself alone. And not another. Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 12. The Bible says. For our rejoicing is this. The testimony of our conscience. That in simplicity and godly sincerity. Not with fleshly wisdom. But by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you. When the Galatians says, and then you shall have your rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Our rejoicing, simplicity, godly sincerity by the grace of God. And that's our conversation in the world. We rejoice in him, not in another. You and I better not look at someone else. Because if we do, we're going to come out reproducing the wrong thing. And one of two things is going to happen. Our rejoicing will be this. Well, you see, I'm better than that person because I, well, there it goes, self-righteous pride. I'm not saying don't grow as a Christian. I'm not saying don't mature as a Christian. I'm not saying don't look at a person or a group of people or something that's going on and say, you know what? That is something that a Christian ought not do. Look, that's righteous judgment. 
That's discernment. Do that. But be careful that if you keep looking that way, be careful that pride doesn't rise. That's why we need to rejoice in him. It's simplicity and godly sincerity. And by the grace of God, we're going to rejoice in that in, in him. And that is going to be our conversation to the world. Other reason why we don't want to keep looking at people is because if we don't say, well, you know, I'm better than them, blah, 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 you know, that whole thing. Eventually, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Eventually, you'll end up being like them. I would pray. I would pray, and the, and, the, and God just said the prayer is not going to come true right now. But I, it was just amazing to me how many people came out for the 2020 election with the signs and the rallies. It was amazing to me. It was inspiring in many ways to me to see one man rally that many people in the middle of COVID-19 while one candidate is in his basement and having social distancing circles with eight people at a rally and another man just across the nation, people are going out, thousands of people with signs. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, I said, man, I would always think to myself, man, that's great, but you know what would be greater? If that many Christians got excited about Jesus Christ. I mean, just, I just want to start a campaign page. Vote Jesus Christ. And I just want to see how many people would rally in the streets with scripture signs that actually have to do with salvation. And we would have revival in this nation. But until people come to the saving faith and the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, it's going to be the same old same. Let us not lose focus on the most important thing. We are going to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. And we are going to try to reproduce something that's worth reproducing. The image of Jesus Christ our blessed and glorious Savior.